OK。All right, we're live. <laughs> Sorry, we're a few minutes late, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Victoria Bruce. You're watching a live stream on the Arundel Patriot Facebook page. Uh, we are an all volunteer nonprofit news organization that's been around for about three years. If you don't know us, and some of you will be new because you're going to be here specifically to hear from Dr. Rayshawn Ray. Uh, who's a very um, integral part of the community and an important voice. Uh, and I think you're muted right now. I'm going to ask you to unmute, Dr. Ray. Hey, how are you? Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> so there's a lag. So if you can just turn the volume down on your face. But yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to meet you. I I, uh, I just want to introduce the show for a second. Um, this is called The Deep because we get an hour into deep conversation about topics that really matter to us, to our viewers, things that don't get covered deeply by in other places. Um, this conversation will be how white people can effectively fight against racism. And I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors of the Arundel Patriot people that have signed on this is all community based we are now patreon model you can you can go to the shop button on the facebook page and become a, pa a patron of this page which is really important a lot of people have come to stand up i'm going to read names real quickly dr ray just sit one second with me while i do this because i wouldn't be here we can't do this without them it's katherine haas sharon and adam bulgis alex provenzano janice fisher barbara and joe bruce Ann Bennett, Antonio Downing, Arthur Hope, C. Chambly, C.J., Carol Brown, Charlotte, Chrissy Holt, Claudia Barber, Don Collins, Don LaMonica, Deborah Elliott, Diana Carter, Jeff Jennifer Haber, Joe Bruce, Kristen Schrecker, Mary Smith, Monica Lindsay, Paula Sparks, Brandy Williams, Rebecca Forti, Robert Cox, Roger Kaiser Ball, Sheila Bryant, Virginia Kalowski, and Deborah Elliott. Thank you all. You're showing us that you really care and you want us to be doing what we're doing, and we're going to keep doing it. So let's get down to the business of the century. Um, I, this is such uh, an emotional week, day, month, year. Uh, 2020 is turning into something that none of us could have suspected. And I think that for some people, this feels like a little bit of a turning point or a huge turning point. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you and I talked earlier this week, and, uh, and I kind of threw it out there that maybe I want to um, to have somebody young interview you to bring young people into this conversation. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Ray real quick and tell you why he's the right person and why he decided that I was the right person to interview him. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Rayshawn Ray, he's a David M. Rubenstein Fellow in Governance, Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. He's an associate professor of sociology and executive director of the Lab for Applied Social Science Research at the University of Maryland College Park. He is also one of the co-editors of Context Magazine, Sociology for the Public. Formerly, Ray was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation health policy research scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. Now, your topics include the mechanisms that manufacture and maintain social inequity and inequality, particularly focusing on civilian and police relationships and men's treatment of women. That's a lot of stuff. For me and myself and how I can contribute to the title of this show, a white person trying to do what I can, I think like this is such, such an important thing that you can help me with, okay? So I'm gonna be middle-aged white woman living in the suburbs. How do I come out and make a difference? Yeah, you know, I think what will kind of guide my comments for the time that we talk here today is that similar to the way that sexism is, a, is an issue that men really have to deal with, there's nothing wrong with women that leads to sexism continuing. And again, as you mentioned, I study men's treatment of women on one hand, and then I study racism and policing and everything that comes along with that health disparities on the other end. So similar to how there's nothing wrong with women, 
that uh, men ending sexism would lead to. Uh, there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism wouldn't solve. With that being said, I think and research highlights that it's oftentimes up to white people to end racism. And I always find it interesting because I think oftentimes when I have conversations with white people, they feel so powerless in these situations. And I think part of the reason why is because the narrative we've given people, particularly white people about racism, is that there's nothing they can do to deal with it. Um, and it's also a narrative that they've done nothing to contribute to it. And oftentimes they haven't done anything directly to contribute to it, but implicitly and complicitly, they do participate in it. And oftentimes denial, silence, as well as not exerting the amount of power that they actually have is part of it. So I'll give an example, and then I think we can unpack it because what I'm gonna really talk to people about is a racial equity framework to put people on a pathway to transitioning from being a racial equity learner, which I'll define later, to becoming a racial equity advocate and then becoming a racial equity broker. So as I think about the Anne Arundel Patriot and people who are participating in this, all the people who you shouted out, the people who I, some people who I care a whole lot about, that being uh, Mr. and Mrs. Collins in particular, which is, you know, I thank them one of the reasons why I'm on here today, is that we can put people on that pathway. And I highlight it this way. Everyone's focusing on George Floyd and rightfully so. People are also focusing on Ahmaud, uh, Ahmaud Arbery and rightfully so. People are also focusing on COVID-19 disparities, rightfully so. And as we look at this, really what we're facing in America are two pandemics. We're facing COVID-19, which hopefully eventually we get a vaccine for, we get enough people vaccinated, similar to what happened with the flu in the 50s and 60s. And then this will become an integral part of our life, maybe having a vaccine, but people won't be dying. We won't see over 100,000 people dying. We won't see my wife as a healthcare provider having to to work more than she normally does, having to come in the house and remove all her clothes, instantly take a shower, sleep in a separate room for going on 13 weeks. Hopefully that won't be the norm, but that is our norm right now. But we view this as temporary in the grand scheme of life. Racism on the other hand, is the other pandemic that America has always dealt with. It's our original sin that we have never fully dealt with. And when I interviewed Congressman Akeem Jeffries at Brookings, he said that the United States has a genetic birth defect on the question of race. And when I think about policing, as I'll highlight later, I think that the way that we like to highlight bad apples in policing, they bad apples have to come from somewhere. For those who like to plant and garden, bad apples come from rotten trees. Those rotten trees have rotten roots. And I'll say something about that later. But the example that I think fully highlights this moment is what happened between Christian Cooper and Amy Cooper in Central Park. And part of highlighting this is the fact that with Christian Cooper, here he is, a graduate of Harvard, doing great things, former managing editor of Marvel. None of those things should matter, though. The only thing that should matter is he was in his place trying to take some pictures and look at birds, and a dog not being on a leash disrupts those birds. He asked her to put on her leash. What does she do? Instead of saying, you know what, that actually is a rule. Okay, I will put my dog on a leash and go to the part of the park where my dog actually doesn't have to have on a leash or just go to another place. She, as a self-proclaimed liberal white woman who voted for Hillary Clinton, living in Manhattan, representing all of this progressiveness and liberalness, what did she pull out of her mind to use? She used the oldest racial trope that exists in the United States a damsel in distress, a white woman being threatened and victimized by a black man, knowing full well that when she called the police and when the police come, whose side are they gonna be on? They're gonna be on her side. When it comes to culpability and believability, whose side are they gonna be on? They're gonna be on her side. And then probably as much as she says she's an advocate for animals, she then shakes her dog to shriek so that the 911 operator could hear the dog yelp and then she says specifically, a black man is threatening me in Central Park, knowing what Central Park means to white womanhood and black criminalization in the United States. She pulled out the oldest racial tropes in the United States that date back before the birth of a nation, the actual founding of our country, as well as the book and the movie. And in that moment, this moment highlights this, what we're talking about. Because at that moment, without that smart camera phone that Christian Cooper had, Amy Cooper held all the power, all of the power. It didn't matter that Christian Cooper went to Harvard. It didn't matter that he was a bird watcher. It didn't matter that he wasn't doing anything wrong. 
she held all the power. And what I hope people are getting just in these few minutes as I go on and on about this, because I think it's an important point, is that when we talk about racism, white people for some reason act like they don't have the power, when in fact they hold the power, similar to what I know from studying gender, that when men try to act like they don't have the power in interactions, I'm like, no, you have all the power. And in fact, if you just created equitable power, if you didn't talk about women behind closed doors in the way you talk about women's bodies, in the way you talk about their minds, in the way you talk about their emotions, that wouldn't spill over into boardrooms where all of a sudden, when you give a woman a promotion, she's not paid less money. But instead, the narrative becomes, we're going to put it on the woman that she didn't advocate for herself, that she didn't ask for more money. When we know research shows at baseline, women just get paid less than men for doing the same exact thing they're doing, no matter what the occupation is. But for some reason, our narratives don't exist like that when we talk about inequality. So what I hope I'm going to be able to provide, and I know you got a lot of questions, so after this, I will do rapid fire, but I think it's important for to set the tone that the perception that white people are powerless is completely false. Instead, the power is in white people's hands to help end racism. So thank you for starting with Amy Cooper, because that was at the top of my list as well, right? Because I could see myself in that person, not, not so much that I... I mean, I'm someone who has been working on race relations, but I saw the middle-aged white woman in the park walking the dog and I knew immediately, and, and it's actually different. She didn't say a black man's here to threaten my life. She said an African-American man. Mm -hmm. So Miss Amy Cooper was being politically correct. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the liberal white woman in the park and using political politically correct, liberal language, not racist language, not the N-word, and then calling the cops and putting this man's life in jeopardy. And when I saw that woman, I said, I, I immediately felt like that is a lot of women that I saw at the Women's March. And I think I mentioned the other day, one of the posters that I saw at the Women's March still rings in my head today because it said, if Hillary won, I'd be at brunch right now. So the, the, the white liberals who consider themselves, and women especially, since that's where I'm coming from, who consider them th themselves not racist, are now realizing that they are, there are these overtones, they are, they are being told they have privilege, they feel very defensive, right? So how do we bring them from that place, all those Amy Coopers out there, who've had privilege, and, and I don't even like to call it privilege, it's adequate, like everyone should be treated adequately without being in fear of being killed, everyone regardless of skin color. How do we um, say, look, Amy Cooper and friends at brunch, we really need you out on the streets right now. And I have to say some of the Amy Coopers that I thought I knew were Amy Coopers and maybe they were, are out in the streets right now. So it's very encouraging. What can we say to get right the voting block right to actually care about this issue so much that they don't put it down again yeah great question you know i, I wish i was at brunch too uh like founding farmers in dc is like my favorite brunch place along with farmers fishers and bakers I, I wish i was there too um and you know hopefully we'll get to that point and we can do that again you know my, my grandfather who served 21 years in the military purple heart bronze star served in two wars he always taught me from birth and my silence is my acceptance. And what I know from studying race is that unfortunately, as much as some of us try to integrate our lives, um, you know, friends across various walks of life, across race and class and diff different geographic locations, when we really oftentimes look at our inner circle, we're looking in the mirror. That it looks like us simply based on the way segregation operates. So we have an obligation to speak up and speak out. Part of what, why is that important? Well, Shirley Chisholm, who's a congresswoman from Texas, she told us that if you're not sitting at the table, you're on the menu and someone's eating you for lunch. And oftentimes at our dinner tables every night, other groups of people are on our menus and we're eating them. And we're not defending those people. And when you become an advocate, because see right now what's happening in this moment, a lot of people are becoming indoctrinated into race relations in America, the history of it, and then, as we're talking, what to do about it. So they're becoming what I call racial equity learners, learning about the process, 
when you become a racial equity advocate, you advocate for people whose identities are marginalized to the sense where even when they speak up and speak out, people don't hear them. This is important because if we go back a few years ago, five years ago or so, Colin Kaepernick in the NFL started a silent protest where he knelt at, at the beginning of the game, three minutes while our national anthem was on. And again, as just given my own biography, I mentioned my granddad, my mother was admitted to West Point as a black woman in the late seventies. That is still miraculous. Yeah. She chose to get out the military and raise me another miraculous feat. It's one of the reasons why I'm here today. Um, and my grandmother and my aunt and my godfather played a role in me being here. So I don't take those things for granted. So for me, I stand. But if one of my friends wanted to sit, you know what my granddad told me before he passed away? He said, you know what? That's why I fought in those wars. That's why America is great. Because the First Amendment gives people the right to do whatever they want to do as long as they're not harming anyone else. But because people didn't listen to what Colin Kaepernick started, there were people who then implemented what King said. Of course, MLK was nonviolent. But then they started implementing what he said, which is where he said a riot is the language of the unheard, where when people no longer listen, that's all they feel like they can do. So when we sit at these dinner tables, we have to become an advocate, which is different from being an ally. People always talk about allies. Allies are people who wear a pendant. They say, yeah, I'm in solidarity with you. But you know what? Allies are oftentimes reactionary. Advocates are proactive. So they think consciously about what is the conversation I'm going to have with my kids at the dinner table so they grow up to really be racially equitable. Because, see, we don't live in a colorblind society. So the narrative about colorblindness simply doesn't work because all of the messages and images that kids are getting is the exact opposite of that. If you, want, if you really want your kids to be racially equitable, you have to employ what Ibram Kendi called an anti-racist framework. Because since our society is imbued with racism, we have to do the exact opposite to take that out. And then we become racial equity brokers. That means we ensure that in the places where we work, play, dance, and worship, that our policies, rules, regulations, and laws are equitable, not just colorblind, racially equitable. Those are different things. It means if you have a disparity that exists, you evaluate it. If you have a disparity, you have to correct for that disparity. When someone says something you don't agree with, you don't have to say a whole bunch of stuff. Sometimes you can just say, you know, I actually disagree with that. And then they're like, what? It's like, look, it, and it happens all the time with me when I'm with my friends and family in social settings and somebody says something and I'm like, no, nah, I, I disagree with that. That's not true. And they're like, why? You know, they, I'm like, look, I'm, I'm not going to do this with you right now. We're trying to brunch. We're having a good time. We're drinking mimosas. But after this, we can talk about this. I just want to go on record for you and everybody else that that's not right. And I disagree with that. And you know what typically happens when you speak up? Either someone else who's there or later says, hey, thank you. I really appreciate you doing that. And you know what you do? You model. And when I do that for my kids, I've noticed that even at eight and nine years old, they are starting to employ that. And it is so empowering. That is the empowerment part. It's not about using power to disadvantage people. It's about empowering people for equity. So along those lines uh, about speaking up, one of the things, one of the best quotes I heard, well, there's a million quotes, like you're re I'm reading everything, I'm so emotional. But Meghan Markle, you know, said she was asked, what, what can people do? And I don't remember the exact quote, but was, it was, you have to say something. Like yeah. Saying something is better than saying nothing. And I have been told by friends, close friends who, you know, are not wanting to be racist and wanting to do something that they have fear. They have a lot of fear. They have fear of, of saying the wrong thing. Do I say black? Do I say African-American? Am I going to offend somebody? Um, I don't have black friends. I don't know how to get in, have black friends because I don't know the language. And so talk a little bit about like, how do we, how do we take this, um, this fear away from white people that they can start going out and, and being part of, uh, you know, not just the fight against racism, but just that the, the real reason is that we're all one and really start to meet each other, love each other and stop the hate and stop the killing of, of black people by police, by strangers coming down the road when you're jogging and all of the terrible things that 
you know, black people have to worry about when they leave the house. Yeah, I mean, underneath the skin, I mean, we're 99.5% similar to one another. And, you know, the way I think about fear and silence, um, I use this analogy. Imagine being at the airport, you are going down the escalator, you know, just the, the ones that go straight. You hopped on with your luggage. And all this stuff is happening around you. Some people are walking. And even if you are on the escalator and you're standing still, you, you're going to probably still beat the person who's walking because you're moving faster. There are people who are late, they're trying to run, they're trying to catch up, they're falling over things. This is the way our society operates when it comes to inequality. That there are all these things happening besides us, beside us, and we are just moving down the escalator, allowing things to go, even if we don't agree with it. And so I think what people have to do is really get over that fear. First couple of times, yeah, it's gonna be rough. You know what? Unfortunately, life is rough for black people every single day like the same way women deal with things every single day. So when I hear men say that, I'm like, get over yourself. Like, you know, like, like literally, it's, it's, it's literally that simple, like get over yourself. But when it comes to practicalities beyond that, one of the best things to do is to mimic. So identify people who you think do this well, like you become a person people should mimic. You know, we were having the conversation the other day, people can model you. So it's like, what do you do to kind of have these conversations. How do you deal with it? But this is why this is most important though. It's not mostly about white people getting black friends, even though I think that's important too, but it's more important to recognize that the segregation of our lives is oftentimes the reasons why our friendship networks are limited. Um, it's important for white people to talk, though to talk to other white people. That's what's key. White people talk to white people every day. That's who we want you to talk to because that's the sitting at the table setup. We're not at that table. Like, so the people who don't have black friends, we are on the menu of the other people at your table. The best example I can give for this is when I, I lived in Germany, I taught at the University of Mannheim um, in Germany for a while. And while I was there, I would go to dinner with Germans and uh, these dinners were great. The food was great. And they were always really long, just culturally, the dinners were much longer. And um, I remember sitting at the table, it was all Germans, and then it was a few Americans and maybe somebody from Switzerland and Netherlands or something, but there were no Turks at the table. People from Turkey are the largest minority group in Germany. And they would start these conversations and like, you know, Rayshawn, if you and your wife went here, there, well, don't go there late at night, don't go this. And when I got, the more I got to listening to it, I started noticing that they were talking about locations and areas where Turks were. Some of the places we had already been and we were like, we haven't had any problems in those places. And I started noticing it was at that moment where I was like, oh, this is what it is. This is the way white people talk about black people in America, but I'm never at those tables. And so I started noticing that the table reference is really important. So it's important for people to mimic, okay? I think this also gets back to being a racial equity learner. There are a series of phenomenal books for people to know, but when it comes to policing, I'm gonna give people four stats that should help them. First stat. Black people are 3.5 times more likely than whites to be killed by police when they're not attacking or have a weapon. 3.5 times more likely. That's the reason why people are protesting in the street. This is an example of George Floyd. Everyone's seen the video. He wasn't attacking. He wasn't resisting. He didn't have a weapon. And there are other examples of that. But unfortunately, we know that people lie, like the way Amy Cooper was lying, the way that Michael Slager lied on Walter Scott when he said that Walter Scott was trying to take his weapon and that's why he shot him in South Carolina. Somebody just happened to be riding by seeing the interaction and recorded it. Imagine if we didn't have smartphones to capture what happened to George Floyd, Christian Cooper and Ahmaud Arbery. A, we wouldn't even be having this conversation, but B, we wouldn't be in the middle of this movement. So technology matters. So part of it is also speaking up and speaking out. What does that look like? Say you're at a public place, at brunch, like you got me all want, all thinking about brunch. So those are the only analogies I can give right now. Cause I'm, I, I don't even like, I like brunch. My wife really likes brunch, but I, I miss brunch right now. So now you got, you got that on my mind. So, and, and say you see someone mistreated, like say for example, in a small slice, like you've seen a black family come in before you and then you put your name down on the list and you notice that it's four of you and four of them. But then not only do you get called back before them but somebody else does too. And then you notice that they get set in a corner away from everybody, or they get set in a different section, which is what happens to black people all the time. And you see it, right? And either at that moment, you have, you have the ability to do one of two things, ignore it and act like you didn't notice it and just say, oh, that's a coincidence. No, it wasn't a coincidence that actually happened or speak up and do something. What can you do? Use your power, call the manager over and say, 
let me tell you what I just noticed. I would hate, I would hate to think what this looks like right now. You know what? You just made change. And you tell them, it's like, look, I, I just don't want you to correct this situation. I patronize this establishment. My family spends a lot of money. You need to make sure this doesn't happen moving forward. When it's a large corporation, I write a letter. When I see inequality, because sometimes it's difficult to speak up and speak out in that moment, right? Like you're doing something and you see something that happens really fast. You're like, did, did that just happen? But then you process it. And you're like, wow, I actually did think that happened. You write a letter. A, it's therapeutic for you. But B, you let them know as a customer that that's something you notice and that you expect more from them. So there are multiple ways to use your voice. It's not just about using it in the moment. Use it with the people who you care about. I found that if you can speak up and speak out with the people who you care about the most and who care about you, you can speak up with anybody. So go through the struggle, the fear of actually talking to the people you care most about, which sometimes is the people, the person who sleeps in the bed right beside you. You know, whether you're a man or a woman, they might have different ideologies from you. They might have different thoughts about policing and racism and protest. And oftentimes it's a conversation, but it starts with getting over the fear and just talking. I love that. So, you know, my demographic is really good at calling the manager. So you should call your manager skills. To you got it. You got to call the manager. Like, that's what I'm saying. They call the manager for everything else. Like, right. oh, my food wasn't warm. And I, but then you see a black person or a Latino person getting discriminated against and you get silent. The contradiction of you, like in black people notice white silence. That's very, very important. For people who have black friends or work with black people, we notice when you're silent and when you're not. So all of a sudden, somebody forgot to put new coffee filters in, in the coffee mug and you're going crazy, but then you just seen something happen to me in the parking lot, you don't say nothing? Got you. Right. I, I see you. Like, like we, we see that. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. Um, so I'm gonna take a couple questions and I, I was so engrossed with Dr. Ray that I didn't throw it out there that we are taking questions, but apparently you guys knew that because you've been being <laughs> a Rundle Patriot. Um, I'm gonna take a question here from Jane for Dr. Ray. She says, what is the one action a white person can take to help end racism in his or her city? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I really think, and, and of course we've been talking about what we would consider in sociology micro level um, solutions um, that you just enact in your life. I think those matter, but I think there's a broader policy point. I think particularly for an organization like you all is to not just use your vote, but use your voice in between votes. So right now, I think when it comes to policing, there are a few things to advocate for. Well, actually in the state of Maryland is two, but federally is three. The first is to have comprehensive data reporting. So we know how many people are killed by jellyfish in the United States, the CDC collects it, but we don't know how many people are killed by the police. I think most people probably listening to that just find that appalling. We only have data at the federal level on 16 states. So there have been journalists and researchers trying to curate data. And I think, you know, we're getting good databases, but it's not at the federal level. So that's the first thing. Why is that important? It's not just about collecting it, but why is it important? It's important because comprehensive data reporting reduces officer-involved killings by 25%. Why does it do that? It does that because police departments and I've worked with, I should have said this earlier, I've worked with dozens of police departments around the country. I have an implicit bias training course that's approved by the state of Maryland. I have a train the trainer course that the Department of Homeland Security and the military uses. And then in Maryland, we have a virtual reality decision-making program that we developed with major corporations to help police officers make better, and better decisions to help them get home safely and help the people who they're interacting with leave the interaction safely, whether that be going home or whether that be being arrested for something. And so part of thinking through this is the data not only allow us to figure out where problems are, data also allow us to identify things where law enforcement are getting things right. And then we can build on that and mimic those best practices because right now we don't have those data. I mean, like I have a good sense of what's working and what's not, but we don't have that comprehensive data. Second, um, we need to ensure that officers who are terminated due to uh, misconduct or who resign in the midst of a misconduct lawsuit, that's very, very key because officers will resign. The fraternal order police will tell them to resign and go to another place. That's what happened with the officer in Cleveland, Ohio, who killed 12 year old Tamir Rice, who was playing with a toy gun in the park. That officer had resigned from another department because he was deemed unfit mentally to be a police officer. Then not only did he kill Tamir Rice, go through that situation, 
be terminated from that department, but then he went to another department and worked again. That's how this plays out. We have a law in the state of Maryland called the Antoine's Law, and it's about the same thing that happened to a person on the Eastern Shore, a Black man on the Eastern, Eastern Shore. An officer from Dover, Delaware, had a similar situation, came to Maryland, killed a Black man. So, so we need those data. The third big thing is we need to make a shift in uh, civilian payouts for police misconduct. What does this mean? George Floyd's family is eventually going to get a large civil payout. The money that his family is paid in in taxes is going to be the same money used to pay them back for the dehumanization and murder of their loved one. How much money are we talking about? Well, let's take Freddie Gray. That was nearly $6 million. Let's, like, let's take Corinne Gaines. If people don't know about her, her name is spelled with a K. Look her up. Corinne Gaines was a mother who had said she had been being accosted um, by police, had been recording it on Facebook. In short, led to a standoff in her house. She's holding her son with a gun. Police come in, shoot and kill her. Accidentally shoot and kill her gun. Uh, her son um, shoot uh, accidentally shoots her son. Her son and her family was awarded thirty million dollars. Baltimore doesn't even have enough money to pay them out. Making this shift makes it like a healthcare model for those people in healthcare. Know that if you perform surgery in a hospital or if you're a nurse or what have you, that things go wrong. Malpractice physician leaves a cloth in somebody's body, takes out the wrong organ, heaven forbid, kills someone. There's a malpractice lawsuit that goes on. And sometimes physicians, if they're not good at their job, it's not always that they're just being egregious trying to hurt somebody. Sometimes they're just not good that the hospital says, you know what, you are costing us too much money. Our premiums have increased. You can't perform surgery here anymore. And we're going to refer you to the medical board to remove your license. We can do this same process for policing. That gives uh, police chiefs to say like the officer Chauvin who killed George Floyd, he had nearly 20, nearly 20 police misconduct allegations. She should not have been on the street. The officer in Prince George's County who killed the man in his police car several months ago, he had been involved in two officer involved shootings before that. He shouldn't have been on the street. His name is Michael Owens and he's a black officer. And that's important because the research I've done on policing shows that the race of the officer doesn't matter in how they treat someone. That's another narrative. That's a, a racial equity learning moment for people. This isn't a white male officer on black man thing. That's not how it works. This is just an officer on black person thing. It doesn't matter what the race of the officer is. It doesn't matter what the gender of the officer is. We see similar outcomes. So I think when it comes to what people can do, they can take these policy solutions I just outlined contact their representatives in Anne Arundel County or where else, particularly people who are on the Judicial Committee in the House of Delegates and the State Senate, I was actually talking to them yesterday around the same time on this, that they just formed a subcommittee on police misconduct and use of force. They need to hear from you about these ideas and let's get uh, these things changed and move forward Maryland to be at the forefront of this. Awesome. So uh, I want to thank Yasmin for producing this segment. So if you could um, put in the comments, I'm sure she will, all these great recommendations from Dr. Ray. Um, moving along, I, I was introduced to you, Dr. Ray, by um, Mrs. Don Collins and of the uh, Second Lieutenant Richard W. Collins III Foundation, who I am very, very grateful to be a new board member of that foundation. And I'm very excited to work on the behalf of the foundation. Uh, for those of you who don't know and may not be from this area, Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant Richard Collins had just graduated from college. Uh, it was a, three years ago and he was hanging out with friends on the street and was murdered and stabbed to death by a person with ties to white supremacy organizations. That person happened to be from our county, Anne Arundel County. So, that, uh, that was a rallying point for a lot of people around here. A lot of women, white women, black women, mothers. Nobody can know Mrs. Don Collins' story and not be, mm -hmm. feel like their heart is being ripped out. He became all of our son. Um, and mm -hmm. however, in, in Severna Park, I was just interviewing a white friend yesterday who was at a white silence protest uh, where the, everyone laid down for eight minutes and repeated the what um, George, Lloyd, George Floyd said the day he died. But mm. that woman said her daughter was in high school at the time that Lieutenant Richard Collins was murdered. And every day she would say, did they talk about it at school? Because the, the murderer was actually from that school. Yeah. And they never did. 
and it was never discussed. And in that neighborhood, very few people even came to a vigil for Lieutenant Collins. How the question is for people who um, may not necessarily be overtly racist in their home around their own dinner table, but have a, a son, possibly a daughter, who is um, influenced by hate groups online, at school, apparently they're infiltrating college campuses. How to raise a child who doesn't commit a racial murder? I mean, it, you know, it's such a heavy topic um, talking about Lieutenant Collins and knowing the Collins so well. I mean, it just kind of breaks my heart every time I hear it. I mean, I have two two boys, an uh, eight and a nine year old. And I mean, it's just unfathomable to, to kind of think through that. And, and I think part of what people have to realize is that hate groups, and I, I've testified before um, the Maryland State Legislature on this with the Collins, is that hate groups have increased about 100% in the United States over the past couple of decades. Hate crimes are also increasing. I know we like to think of progress as moving forward, but we have to actually make it move forward. We can't just stand on the escalator. If we stand on the escalator, things are gonna reverse. We have to be willing to move, the, move things ourselves in the direction that we want. So what I urge people to do is the first thing, have conversations with your kids regularly about race, about gender, about inequality. See what they're thinking. See what their friends are saying. Don't judge. Don't snap. Don't like, and I know it's hard because, you know, I mean, I know it's hard when, you know, my kids tell me something one of their friends did. I'm like, what? I'm like, that's crazy. I'm calling his daddy. No, don't, don't do that. You know, don't call their mom or their dad because now you've breached trust with your kid. Right now, there are ways to, to deal with the other parents in the other family. I could talk about that, too. But for people's own kids, check in. Then what you do, you gather intel, figure out what they're thinking, figure out what they're learning. Then you do your research. You talk to people and you come back to them days later to continue the conversation. You know, in the black community and now now more broadly, people always talk about the talk, the talk that black parents have with their kids particularly black boys about interactions with the police. I've been thinking about the talk and you know, having boys, the talk isn't a singular conversation. The talk is an ongoing conversation. People think that we can have one conversation about racism. It's like suggesting we can have con one conversation about sexism, right? Like what my kid was talking about two years ago when he would come home and say something like, yeah, daddy, boys can run faster than girls. Oh yeah, okay, you know what I do? I showed him a whole bunch of videos of gymnasts, of tennis stars, of track stars, of soccer athletes. And I was like, can you do that? Can you swim like Katie Ledecky in the pool? Okay, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And then we have a conversation about debunking this, right? So it's an ongoing conversation. He doesn't do that anymore. Now he has a new thing that he's talking about. So we gather until we listen to them and then we go do our homework. And then the other thing we do, we have, and we, my wife and I have always done this. We've been together since high school. We, so yeah, I mean, we like an old couple right now. Like, and again, we were talking my age, like, you know, like I'm turning 40 this year. So I mean, we've been together like over half of our lives at this point is that um, one thing that we do is we have uh, parents and families that are at different life stages who we consult with. When we have an issue, we check in. I call them the council. Everybody should have the council. They should build five people to talk to about race in America. So when something happens, I'm like, hey, our kids said this about gender or race. When your kids said this, what did you do? You know, typically what they say, they typically say, ah, yeah, I remember what, when that happened. We kind of missed the boat, but let me tell you what we should have said, right? And then we come back to our kids a few days later and like, hey, you remember we were talking about such and such, so-and-so said something on Fortnite when y'all playing the game and they made this statement. Let me tell you what I think about that and what you should do about that. And that is the ongoing conversation to have with kids. Figure out what they're thinking and then do your homework as a racial equity learner to be an advocate and a broker to help your kid do the same. I think that's great advice because I, I think back, you know, the way I was raised, it was, I, I knew my, my mother was not, was trying, well, she was not racist and she actively sought to bring in friends of different races, but we never talked about it, right? 
So it was like, I, I found myself and actually you brought this up. So, you know, let me tell you a story about my white guilt. But in tw when I was 20, eight, 20 years old, 18 years old, I worked in a nightclub in California and I was a cocktail waitress. And one day the bouncer came up to me and he goes, Vicky, he said, the, the manager says that we're not supposed to let black people in. Mm. He says they have this dress code and if too many black people are in and they had code words for it mm -hmm. and his name was Ron Newman, the owner, it was the Red Onion restaurant. So I'm putting it out there and I saw a lawsuit happen a few years later. So I was really happy about that, but I said <laughs> nothing. I said nothing. I kept my job there. Mm -hmm. I have so much guilt for that. Um, so, you know, what you're saying now is so important, you know, to, to just be strong and stand up, even when we're scared as white people, even when we may jeopardize something, because it's not worth it, because I live with that. And I, I want, you know, it's just, I, I can't, you know, I want to make rep reparations. I want truth and reconciliation. But it's really hard. And it's like we have we were raised uh, thinking that we could get away with anything. And, you know, mm -hmm, yeah. and come to the point where now we know it was at the expense of someone else. And that can't be anymore because we're, you know, we're calling it race, but we're all one race. And that was another question. I've got all these questions. People have all these questions. No, let, let's do I rapid fire. No, no, let's let's do rapid fire. I mean, one, one thing, I, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try and answer these in 90 seconds. I'm gonna do good. I, I can I'm good at that when I actually focus. So <laughs> I was just gonna say to your point, I think we've all had incidents where we felt like we should have done more. I mean, I, I know I have several. I mean, it's just part of life. And I think we can use those as learning opportunities. So I know one thing when we talk about kids is like, I realize my kids think my wife and I are perfect. You know, and I think a lot of parents, I mean, a lot of kids view their parents like that. You know, the older you get, you, you start to realize that your, your parents aren't um, invincible. They're more like superheroes with a flaw. You know, they're not gods. But they're superheroes like they, they do super things all the time for, for kids. But with that being said, I think the moments where we feel like we failed it are moments that are best learning opportunities for other people. So I'm so I'm so appreciative to hear you share that. And, you know, and I think about the you know, I, I play out that social interaction you talk about. And I've been on the other side of that continuum where I literally remember two incidents vividly where I'm walking into clubs, like people ask me, like, do I like to go club? I'm like, clubbing. I'm like, no, like I used to when I was younger. But one of the reasons why I don't is because of these experiences. I was with a diverse group of people. I was kind of in the back talking to someone and it's happened twice. They let the people in front of me in who were with my group and then stopped me. I was actually dressed nicer than them. It wasn't about attire. It wasn't about anything. It was because I was black. Now, some of my friends didn't say anything. Some of the other ones, you know, we were with a work group, like went off on the person. But then one of the other ones was like, you know what? We're just going to write a letter. Tell them how much money they lost tonight, how I have a friend who's a journalist and we're about to blast them in the paper. You know, like those are the, that, that's using power for racial equity, right? So we can mimic these kind of things. And to your point, I mean, all of us have had those moments. We learn from them, we move on and we aim to do something about it moving forward. Thanks, Dr. Ray. Okay, um, I have a question. Charlotte Armstrong is asking, how do we get away from centering the conversation around white people, um, white, conversation around white people, white still making progress with educating them, us? Mm, okay, I get it. Okay, so good. essentially saying, you know, um, oftentimes there is a, a tax. We call it like, like with black people, it's a black tax or a Latino tax. Um, I also think it's a, it's a gender tax, a woman tax where you have to educate another group of people. Um, and, I, and I get that point. You know, as a person who studies this, it's kind of part of my job to, to discuss the work that I do. But I don't necessarily think it's up to Black people to educate white people. Um, I do think that if people are friends, they're going to have conversations. You know, some of the best conversations I had, the, the times in which I learned the most about what white people are thinking, the depths of their souls and minds, is my best friend from high school, who's a fireman. We played football together. I was best man in his wedding. He was in my wedding. If anything happens with my grandmother and my mom and my granddad when he was living, I call him. Like I know he's the one and I have another friend who I can really, really depend on. 
And so we have really in-depth conversations. We just had one recently. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it's one of those feelings where when you can have that kind of conversation with someone, it's important. But in that moment, I don't necessarily interpret it that I am having to educate him and vice versa. We're having a conversation because it's authentic. And I think Black people have to protect their own mental, physical, and emotional health to not keep giving. Because it's one of those things where it is taxing. It's a tax. And instead, what we want to do is getting back to what I said earlier, identify white people to mimic. So people can mimic you. They ask you, what would you do? They ask you. So if you were in that situation, what would you have done differently? You know what I would have done differently? And this is one of the things I learned being in the academy is there are always people who you can spin your lives on, who can spin their lives on you. So now like, I'm, you know, as a tenured, now I, I just got a promotion now, like tenured full professor in Maryland. Um, I, uh, yeah, I haven't said much about it. It recently <laughs> happened. I'm still, still processing it. But as that person, I have lives to use on other people who have less status than me, grad students, assistant professors, staff members. Identify those people at your workplace who do have the power where when they speak up, the repercussions of them speaking up doesn't hit them as much. So you as a cocktail wait waitress probably didn't have the power to do that. You would have been fired. You probably needed that job. But somebody else who worked there, they could have spoken up for you. So identify the people who can use their lives on you so like when a student comes to me and she says she's been harassed by someone, oh, I'm, I'm scaling it up immediately. When a student comes to me and says that he's been racially discriminated against, I'm scaling it up immediately. They don't always have to do it. I can take that life on and that burden because I have the status and the power and influence to actually do something about it and not face recourse. Another question coming from Turkey. My parents weren't racist because it's not like that in Turkey, sort of monolithic society, right? But being in this America society made them afraid of black people. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I mean, when you look on TV, I mean, the images that we see on TV show and suggest that black people are overly criminal. When research actually shows that violent crime has significantly decreased. And when you actually ask people, probably like this person's parents, have you actually had an, a negative interaction or something where you could have been fearful? Most of the time people say no. So it's in people's heads. And why is this important? Because social psychological research shows that um, the same fear that people have of snakes and spiders, like people literally have a physiological reaction. That's the same reaction some people have to black men when they are in close proximity to them, like being in the elevator. It's happened to me so many times. I'm a professor at a major university, don't have a criminal record, and yet and still I face the same set of stereotypes that any other black man does. So oftentimes my life is more similar to the man who picks up my trash than it is to the, to the professor who's in the office next door to me. And that's what race does, is that these stereotypes oftentimes come off that perceive black men as overly threatening, overly aggressive, that weaponize our skin. What does that mean? That means again, even when we don't have a weapon, even when we are not attacking, our physical bodies give off stereotypical associations that suggest people should fear us. And then not only does it lead to fear, it then justifies any action done to our bodies. And when we talk about police violence, for those who can't get that in your, in your head, that process I just made, now imagine giving you a gun and giving you qualified immunity. You end up with the racial gap in police disparities, like I highlighted earlier. So I know you have to jump right at right before six. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what I what I would hope is the Great White Awakening right now, um, thanks to the series of events that happened recently, and perhaps COVID keeping us all on edge and our emotions at the front. And uh, somebody had posted a picture of a woman. And she was holding a sign, a white woman, and it said, uh, when George Floyd called for his mama, it opened up, it, he was calling to all of us mamas. Mm. And it just broke me. Yeah. And I feel um, so, so much like we can't let this moment go away. And I've seen so many, so many people come to the table that I have never expected, that I've never heard a word out of them about political, racial anything and it's very it's making me feel very um hopeful how do you feel as a black man who studies this as in this moment 
Yeah, I mean, I'm cautiously optimistic. You know, um, I do think that it's been an awakening. And I also think the awakening isn't just white people. You know, I think everyone has been awakened. You know, I think a lot of people choose to ignore it for different reasons. I think white people choose to ignore, well, I mean, because what happened to George Floyd, he's just the name we know. We've seen it on video. There are tons of people who that's happened to that we don't know their names where it wasn't captured on video. And it's important for people to know they bear out in the stats. Um, but, you know, I, I think on one hand for white people, it is oftentimes they have the luxury to ignore it. Black people are oftentimes forced to deal with it. And I think part of the reason why we're in an awakening period is because people are forced to deal with it. It's in your face. You can no longer deny it's happening. But I'm cautiously optimistic, A, because we see mostly young people in the streets who are like, I'm not you all. I'm not your generation. I'm not the Xers. I'm not the baby boomers. I'm, I'm, I might not even be, they might not even be millennials. They might be the Ys and the Zs. They're like, we are, we are, we want to see a different America, an America that you all promised us. Mom, dad, you promised us an America where we wouldn't have to deal with this anymore. Yet and still, we're still dealing with it. So you know what? We're going to deal with it in our own way. And I do think they're going to deal with it because I think young people, similar to the civil rights movement, similar to the women's rights movement, it's always young people who can imagine a new America. And what I ask for people who are kind of in our age cohort to do is to reimagine a new America, which is difficult for us to do. But in order for us to reimagine it, when we reimagine it, we have to participate in the reimagining process. We have to participate in the practicalities of it coming to fruition. I, I can take some more. Let, let's go, let's go, let's take, let's go, let's go like five more minutes. They, All right, so they, they're um, going to have to wait. Want, okay, so <laughs> the one thing that, um, gosh, I have so many. The one thing that uh, occurs to me is that um, white people sort of, you know, it was Christian, was it Christian Cooper? In Central Park? Yeah. Oh, uh-huh. And Amy Cooper. Okay. So Christian Cooper, you know, was, you know, the perfect black man for white people. Like Barack Obama was the perfect yeah. black man for white people. So if you voted for white for Barack Obama, you just, you know, you could check off yeah. the I'm not a racist, you know, box on your white person card. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what about that? Like, you know, what about this idealistic idea that w white people have of once a black man has your your stature, mm -hmm. wow, you know, you speak so well, you're so eloquent. And, you know, now you've become, I mean, there are plenty of white people that have, you know, no education. And yet white people still hold black people to like a higher standard of living in order to not be shot by police, to not be, you know, it's just, it seems ridiculous. How do we get into white people's heads that erase, get rid of that idea that everybody deserves yeah. to have security and safety? Yeah, I think it's two, two quick things. First, we cannot outclass racism. So the, the article that you all have sent out where I talked about it, Brookings, bad apples come from rotten trees and policing. I did something that I really do. I went a little bit more personal. And, you know, I mentioned before pe people know my background. I mentioned before I don't have a criminal record. I've been stopped by the police more times than my age. I had that realization as I was approaching 40. Sometimes I've been speeding, sure. But there were a lot of times where there was really no reason for why I got stopped. I've been thrown up against walls by police. I've been arrested by police. You know, I've been accosted by the police, harassed by the police, followed home by the police. Ask me, what am I doing in this house? And I'm like, I live here. Like you just seen me open the garage. I've been stopped multiple times in my own driveway. This is what happens with race. We cannot outclass racism. Then on the other hand, it's important for white people to recognize that simply dealing with class inequality doesn't end racism. Racism isn't only about economics. It's a, it's a large part, but it's not only about it. It's also social and cultural. So even a person who doesn't have a PhD, who doesn't even have a bachelor's degree, might not even graduated high school, are going to be afforded certain privileges and certain opportunities in life that even as a PhD, I still don't get those same opportunities. And so it's important for people to disentangle economics from race, that they're highly related, but they also have different pathways. All right, so one minute to six, uh, my producer saying, ask Dr. Rave, he'll be on again, people love him. 
<laughs> yes, of course. And yeah, and I'll, I'll come back on soon because I know people will add a lot of questions. So let's uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll correspond about it. Send me okay. a message. And yeah, I'll come back on soon. And and again, you are a great interviewer. You ask amazing questions, which I you know knew that you would. And I think this dynamic always works very very well. Well, thank you. And I just want to give a shout out for our our program called Star Straight Talk About Racism, Getting Beyond mm -hmm. the Bullshit. It's every Sunday at two o'clock. We are going to have college age kids this this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, we'd love to have you one day on that show as well. Okay, yeah. bring it, bring it, because we love the straight talk. We love the truth to power. We love you, Dr. Ray. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we'll do a Sunday. All right, you can sign off now, and I'm going to ask for money and okay. the Randall Patriot. And thank you again. All right, thank you. You all have a good evening. All, all right, right thanks, Dr. Ray. All right, Dr. Ray has to check out, but I just want to say thank you to everybody for watching. That was an incredible interview. I want to thank Mrs. Dawn Collins for introducing me to Dr. Ray. Uh, she's been working very hard with the, uh, the foundation in her son's name, and hopefully we can have her on for a one-on-one -on -one soon to announce that. Uh, I think I can give her a call and make that happen. I just also want to say that um, I, like, I nearly cried when I saw this list of people that have signed up to be a patrons to the Arundel Patriot. You guys are making this happen. You're supporting us. Um, the team spends hours and hours and hours every week getting you content, information, planning behind the scenes. Um, it's super important that we have financial support. So thank you to everyone who, who donated or, or became a sponsor. Hit the shop button and you can do that. Yasmin will put it in the comments. You can go to the Arundel Patriot uh, Right, the ArundelPatriot.org, which has all of our print media, and we'll archive all of these videos there soon. Thank you again, and uh, it's wonderful to be part of the conversation in these important times. Knowledge is power. Thanks again for watching.